I get a whole lot of questions from people on what to do with ball python eggs and how I care for my eggs. Today I'll show you everything that I do on the setup and a few distinctions that are incredibly important to me that I think will help the success of your eggs leading to more healthy hatchlings. Stick around, I'm gonna show you everything today. What's going on everybody? It's Adam here at Proper Royals. Thank you for joining me here today. If we've not met before, my channel is all about my family's journey from ball python hobbyist to ball python business. And we document everything right here. And we do it as transparently as possible. We talk money, business, snakes, community, all that good stuff. Hope you consider subscribing if you enjoy today's video. I am fortunate enough to be expecting a clutch of eggs at any moment, and I'm going to be setting up an egg box, and I figure I would show everybody what I do. I got a lot of questions recently from breeder friends that aren't having very good results with their eggs. I don't claim to be an expert on this, but I do know what I do, and I know what works works well for me and I'll tell you coming up on 10 clutches now over the past two years of breeding seasons I've never had an egg go bad other than if it didn't have veins to begin with otherwise all of my eggs have always hatched healthy snakes and I've never had a snake that didn't make it afterwards which are probably unrelated things I'm really kind of focusing on the egg box today I got a few details and tenets that I really hold dear that I think make a difference because most of what I hear from not my own experience from from other friends colleagues people that, are, that just hit me up and ask me questions is they get mold of varying colors and, and it spoils the eggs and that says to me that there's a bacterial exposure that needs to be limited. So I'll take you through today what I do. I'm a little bit crazy and meticulous, as you all probably know if you've seen this channel before. If not, you'll learn today. But I'll tell you exactly what I do with my egg boxes. I'll show you as well. So let's take it away. Before we go any farther, I gotta take a minute and tell you all about JL Royals and Jordan out in West Bend, Wisconsin. Jordan is kind enough to support and sponsor the channel today. He's on Morph Market and Instagram. He's working with genes like Acid, Cypress, Calico, and in recessive projects like Ghost and Pied. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Check out some of these pairings, just two of the pairings that he's got this year for clutches. And by the time you're watching this, you should click on his Morph Market page. These hatchlings, he's making them available. And he's got another four or five clutches on top of these two. He's got a Lemon Blast Soul Sucker that he paired to an Orange Dream Black Pewter Het Ghost. Like the combinations are incredible. I think there's seven genes off the top of my head. I think there's seven genes in the mix in there that could pop out on that clutch. Another pairing, he took a female OD black pewter. He paired it to a pied, so you can get some powerhouse het pieds coming up. He also paired it to a pastel enchi lesser. All of those hatchlings, check them out. They're going to be available on Morph Market. He's a good dude. He's been great to support me. Check out JL Royals 14 at Instagram on Instagram is jlroyals14. The link tree is down below in the description. You can go right to all of Jordan's things. Get your hands on some of these hatchlings before they go anywhere. Jordan, thanks for your support. Audience, let's show this guy some love. I start with Sterilite six quart tubs. You could use whatever tubs you want. Last year I used some, some locking lid uh, tubs as well. Any of the tubs are okay. What you will need is vermiculite. I get this big bag off of Amazon and I'll show you the link in the description as well. It's down below. The vermiculite, I don't, I used to, I used to have like this formula figured out where I would weigh the vermiculite versus the weight of the water. And I learned that from watching Chris Hardwick actually, and I don't knock what Chris is doing. I have found that basically I eyeball the vermiculite now to where it's at about a half to a three quarter inch, closer to half an inch, but go over, don't go under on the half inch. And then what I do, slowly pour water 
until I see it start to run. When I say see it start to run, you can you can pull apart the you can you can run your finger through the vermiculite to the bottom of the tub and then tilt it. And if you see water run through there, that's where I shut it off. If I pour too much water in, you can add more vermiculite and mix it to absorb that water. Instead of trying to get just a precise measure and scale and all of that, that's what I use my my eyes for and I get it to where like I say that water will not run through. Before you do any vermiculite, before you do any water, I sanitize everything. At the beginning of your season, sanitize the inside of your incubator. I use chlorhexidine and I believe I use the uh, the one gallon jug of it. I think I got mine at Tractor Supply, but you can get it on Amazon. I mix mine one to 16. That's safe around the snakes. It's safe around me. I sanitize all the surfaces inside my incubator. Start with a sanitary place. You want to eliminate the homes for bacteria. So not only clean it, but sanitize it. Do the same thing in your work areas. Make sure you're washing your hands. It sounds crazy. Before you handle these eggs, wash your hands thoroughly. Sanitize your work areas. Anything you're going to touch, spray down with that chlorhexidine and get it clean, including the inside of your Sterilite six quart tub. The light diffuser you're going to use, sterilize that. The inside of the tub lid and i'm sorry i'm using sanitize and sterilize interchangeably i should be saying sanitize sanitize with the chlorhexidine it's not going to hurt anything if you leave a little bit of the chlorhexidine residue now let me be clear don't leave so much you don't you want to find the balance between sanitizing and a chemical residue you don't want the chemical residue you want it sanitized that really is my magic weapon. I see people use gloves, and this is this this what I'm about to say about gloves comes from a background in food safety. So I don't consider myself an expert on many things, but I am an expert on food safety. That's what I did for 25 years. Why I wear the chef coat as my gimmick. That's a uh, respectful nod to the industry that got me to this point that I'm at in my life, where I can chase this dream of ball pythons. Here's my take on gloves. If your hands aren't clean to begin with before you put on a glove, if your work area isn't sanitized before you put on a glove, the gloves don't do anything good. They're not necessary. If you look at most chefs, they don't use gloves. They use clean, sanitized areas and they wash their hands incessantly. Working around people before COVID and even during most of COVID, I rarely ever got sick, even though I was around massive amounts of people. It's because I washed my hands endlessly. Nearly every time I touch a plate, I would wash my hands. Almost every time I walk into the kitchen, I'll stop and wash my hands. It sounds so basic, and I know that that's what the CDC would tell us all our lives, and we'd roll our eyes, but washing your hands and keeping a clean work area, I think is the secret to, to my success on the eggs. Knock on wood, I hope I'm not cursing myself on anything here. I'm saying all of this humbly and with my experience and my knowledge. Wash your hands. I do use gloves, but I don't necessarily think that they're as necessary as a lot of people would make them out to be, especially if you're not paying attention to ideas of cross-contamination and only touching sanitized areas or the specimen, i.e. the egg that you're working with. Once you touch cocoa that's soiled, once you touch a snake that's got soil all over it, or you touch a trash can that you throw something away, those gloves gotta come off. You gotta wash your hands again. I know you can think that you could take a seen a, 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 a soiled glove off without touching your clean hands, you can't. You gotta wash your hands again. Your choice on gloves, but I do recommend them. But it's that sanitation process ahead of time that I most highly recommend. Once you've got your vermiculite set up, you're gonna put your light diffuser on the top of it. Here's the thing with the eggs. You wanna position the eggs so that A, they won't roll around. There's two strategies that I use. I use both of these strategies, actually. I like the kind of shingling them in a chevron pattern or a V pattern and that keeps them in place. But sometimes they don't participate. The second you move it, they roll everywhere. First and foremost, what you don't want is the eggs touching any of the sides or the top layer of film that you're gonna put on there at the end, which is where the, the moisture accumulates and then will kind of drip, will, will sag down. If they touch each other, in my opinion, that's okay. And I do that a lot. That's that shingle V-shaped pattern strategy. But I do know people and I do know breeders that separate their eggs from touching each other as well. And they'll use, funny enough, broken pieces of like plasticware forks. Do not put anything wooden in your egg box. 
I don't care how mildew resistant it is. I don't care what wood it is. Bamboo teak. I've seen bamboo bamboo skewers lead to mold in there that have that have poisoned the uh, the eggs, so to speak. No wood, so nothing that can harbor bacterial growth or mold. So you want to keep it plastic in there. You should have only plastic, vermiculite, and the eggs. That's it. Don't don't use toothpicks, pencils. Some people use straws instead of plasticware. That'll work as well. You can poke those up through the light diffuser. A hint on the light diffuser. I get it at Home Depot and they have the huge one that's like two feet by three feet or maybe even two by four. It took me forever to find it in there. Back with the ceiling tiles, it's back where the office ceiling tiles are, not in the lighting area. It's where the ceiling tiles are in Home Depot. It was a fortune to buy the little plastic pieces on Amazon. Ugh. I could buy the whole four by two and just cut it down and trim it down myself. At that point, I, now again, this is do this at your own discretion. A lot of people are gonna disagree with me. I give a light mist, very light, but a light mist of the chlorhexidine spray, the one to 16 blend over the top, and I have that kind of settle on top of the eggs and the vermiculite, not much. Like maybe two squirts of a, of a squeeze bottle. Let it settle on top of the eggs. And then I put the, you know, I love press and seal. I don't understand how oxygen gets in and out of it. I don't understand how the eggs don't suffocate, but I've never had it fail. And I seal them up and I put it away. I try not to even open the door to the incubator. Again, I'm a little concerned with how much oxygen gets in and out of there because mine is completely sealed off. It's right there, that's what I was looking at. But once a week or so, I'll open the door really wide and then flush the air really fast, but that's it. That's the one thing I'll do. I don't open the egg boxes at all. That's another secret, not a secret, but my like firm belief. I don't open the egg boxes at all. I use a little high beam flashlight, little LED flashlight. I shine that into my incubator so that I could see into my egg boxes and I keep an eye on what's going on. If I had eggs that went in with no veins, I keep a very close eye on them. Otherwise, I don't touch it. I, 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 I'm not knocking anybody. This is again, just my experience. But I see people fiddling around. They're taking it out of the temperature control. They see moisture and they're like, I gotta wipe it all down. I gotta keep it dry. You put all that water in there in the vermiculite for a reason. You want it moist. You just, you, ideally, you don't want it touching the sides and you don't want it dripping on your eggs. But honestly, I think you're gonna do more harm opening it. All that sanitation we talked about, the second you pull that press and seal back, bacteria is all around us in the air. So, I mean, on top of having a clean work area and your gloves and everything else, I mean, just your breath. You're gonna have bacteria that's reintroduced into that area. It's an imperfect solution because you're never gonna get rid of all of the bacteria. But the more you keep reintroducing, the more chance you have for spores and mold and things and bacteria to get in there. Let it be, set your incubator. I keep mine set at 89.4. It's what works for me. Uh, some people set it higher. I'll tell you that my incubator I love my incubator, but it's the thing's seven feet tall. It's overkill. It's, it's too much. I know. That's fine. The temperature fluctuation in it with the panels I have poses a real challenge for me. Thankfully, I didn't fill that thing floor to ceiling this year, so I could keep the probe of the 89.4. I keep the boxes in that general area where the probe is. When my egg season is over and when that thing's empty, I'm going to add more panels so that it's consistent inside. I've got four fans running in it and I still get about a degree and a half temperature variation, which I don't think hurts anything. It's also why I keep it set at 89.4 instead of say 90 or even 90 and a half is that the hot zone usually is up right around 90, just under, it doesn't ever go over 91, but right around 91. And then the coolest part of it is above 89, which is where I like to keep those eggs at 89.4. That's what I do. And then I cut on the 58th day. If I see them pip before then, and then I'll cut the rest of the clutch. And, and let me tell you, it's fun. I peek in there every morning. It's like looking for eggs when you're waiting for eggs from the snakes. But now I, I look and see where the pips are, but I don't open the boxes and I don't open the incubator door. Eliminating, you'll never eliminate them all. Reducing variables is 
part of the plan. So a variable would be the temperature when you open the door. It would be a variable of, of reintroducing bacteria if you open those boxes. If you don't see a problem, don't open the boxes. And then you want to mitigate threats. And the threats are largely bacteria. It's why I sanitize everything at the beginning. It's why I'm meticulous about how much water goes in there. I look very, very closely at that. And then really the other biggest threat is if your power goes off for any amount of time. A lot of people say they use water bottles on the bottom. I, I never have. I have what's called a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply. I just got that. I was losing sleep. I got hurricane season coming up here. I have a generator, but I'm always like, what if I'm asleep and the power goes out and I don't know it? The generator's great, but I got to hook up all the cords and, and it, it's, it's, it's a little while of setup to make sure that the generator is running. So that uninterruptible power supply, it'll buy me between three and five hours of power. It is not a permanent replacement for power. It's basically a battery pack that kicks on immediately, but it has an alarm. So it'll wake me up when the power goes out. If it's hurricane season or if it uh, looks like it's going to be a long-term outage, I could get the generator ready. I could get the cords and the cables run before those eggs start to drop temperature. That's what I got. That's how I do it. Let me know if I've missed any details or there's anything you want to know more about. I'm happy to share anything. I'm an open book. And in the meantime, keep it right here on the Proper Royals channel. I'm going to tell you everything that comes out of that incubator. I'll tell you everything that goes into the incubator. And we'll talk about everything that we got going on here at Proper Royals. Thank you so much for joining me today. I cannot wait until I get to see you in the next video. And until then, see ya.